We just had the reading. And we're going to be looking now at the, the last time on this parable. And we're going to take our text from verse 32. Verse 32. Of course, there is a, a, a repeat of this statement. He was dead and now he is alive. But it's a marvelous truth. Listen to this. It was right that we should make merry and be glad. I'm focusing on that statement at the beginning. It was right that we should make merry and be glad. We have it, of course, in verse 29, and they began to make merry. Even the older brother complains that you never gave me a celebration that I might make merry with my friends. That was his complaint, you remember? Well, my text is, is on that verse, verse 32. We come to the end of the parable of the prodigal son, I won't recap it, but of course it's a wonderful parable. It's a marvelous parable. I think, uh, I think it was Charles Dickens that said it was the greatest story ever written, short story ever written. Well, it's a wonderful story. It is a story. It's not really true in the sense that there was a, a, a prodigal son literally, but it was a parable. Our Lord taught this story in a sense, this, this wonderful uh, three stories together to illustrate a great truth. And it's a picture of the gospel. And it's a picture, of course, of a sinner. And it's a picture of the self-righteous. The two sons are important. Undoubtedly, they are in the parable, the, the tax collectors and Pharisees who complain about Jesus receiving sinners. And the Bible clearly states this, that the, this uh, is connected to the first three. There is a parable of a lost son uh, here, but we have, of course, the lost coin, the lost sheep. It's really the, the, the picture of the sinner uh, repenting. And you have, in the end of the first two parables, this joy in heaven over one sinner that repents. What you have in this parable, we said, is just the same, but in deeper. Our Lord tells a bigger story to illustrate the same truth. Some people have called it the parable of the loving father. I disagree with that. Remember at the beginning I said it's primarily about a lost son. Some remember, and I'll mention it again, some remember interpret this parable as, well, he was a believer. He's a backslider. I don't take it that way simply because the context demands that it's about sinners repenting and not about backsliders returning. Because he's a son, you're just making too much out of the story. He's telling a story to illustrate a truth. And the truth is sinners were repenting. Unbelievers were coming to Christ and repenting. And so it's a gospel picture in my opinion. And I think you can make too much out of the parable. That's where truth can be pushed too far. And you end up making your doctrine based on the actual story. And you miss the point of the story. What is the point of the story? Well, it's the title of my message this morning, so we're ending with the theme. But I've been mentioning it all the way through. What is this parable about? Well, the parable is about God, remember it, rejoicing over every sinner that repents. That's the theme of this parable. God rejoicing over every sinner that repents. You have it at the end of the first parable. When there's this joy, rejoice with me. The shepherd is so pleased he's found the lost sheep. The woman has found the lost coin. Rejoice with me. And then Jesus ends it with this joy in heaven over one sinner that repents. And then this great parable where the Father is calling a celebration to rejoice. Now look at how it ends. It says, it was right that we should make merry and be glad. For your brother was dead and is alive again, was lost and is found. Now I would suggest this is the main lesson of the parable. Now let's see how it ends then. Let's bring it to a conclusion. Notice the way the father speaks then. Notice the way he speaks in this parable. Look at the language he uses. It was right. That's what jumps off the page to me. It was right. It's right. You see the point? Well, I'll remind you, I don't want to recap too much, but this was the great problem with the Pharisees, the self-righteous, with the elder brother in the story. He was saying what? It is not right. It is not right that these sinners can get to go to heaven and they've lived so badly. It's wrong. 
It's not right that you are giving this to, to this brother. Uh, uh, well, he doesn't even call him this son of yours. It's not right. He's, he's wasted your inheritance with prostitutes and you do this for him. It isn't right. And yet God says it is right. And that's the important thing to see. It is right. It is right that we should celebrate, that we should make merry and be glad. Now, we've already seen the reason, so I don't want to go into that this morning. Your brother was dead. We had a message on that. Your brother was dead. And what that meant, and he's alive again, he was lost, and now he is found. That's an awesome truth. It stands alone. But we're not looking at that. We're looking at the, 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 the first element of where he ends this parable with this rejoicing. It is right that we should rejoice. The key point is this. That the parable is about God rejoicing. And he's rejoicing himself. God himself is merry and glad. That's what the picture is. He has great joy. He has great pleasure. He has great enjoyment over sinners that are repenting. There is joy in the heart of God over sinners that are repenting. Let's remind ourselves. Listen to verse 6. And when he comes home, he calls his, together his friends, his neighbors, and says, Rejoice with me. There's the shepherd. I have found my sheep that was lost. And then, verse 7, I say, Likewise, there is more joy in heaven over one sinner that repents. Keep your eye on that. Verse 9. Look at this. And when she had found it, she calls her friends, neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me. For I have found the peace that was lost. Likewise, I say, there is joy in the presence of angels of God over one sinner that repents. Do you see it? the phrase that should be clear now? Rejoice with me. That's what God is saying. Rejoice with me. Remember, these parables are a picture of God himself. God himself says to us, rejoice with me. How about that? Now, that is an awesome thought, isn't it? That he would say that to us. As believers, God is saying to us, God wants us to rejoice, but not just to rejoice, to rejoice with him. Oh, he's not only rejoicing, he's saying, I want you to rejoice with me. I want you to join with me. That's an important truth this morning. It's quite clear from the Bible that God wants this. It's quite clear from the Bible, and we haven't got time to look in, uh, we could look at dozens of texts on this that, of course, we did it in the f series when we did the epistle to the Philippians. What was the theme of the Philippians? Joy and rejoicing. That was the theme. He wants us to rejoice. He wants us to know joy. Do you remember it? What was that, what was that phrase in Philippians that stands out? Rejoice in the Lord always. Always. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, <coughs> I'll keep on repeating it all the way through. Rejoice. You notice the phrase, rejoice, but rejoice with a specific mention of the Lord. Rejoice in Him. In Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, when he calls them in revival, not to weep or be sad, but to rejoice. He said, the joy of the Lord is your strength. It's not a time for being miserable. It's a time for rejoicing. There are times when we should humble ourselves and pray and mourn and fast and weep. James tells us that. The Old and New Testament tell us. But the majority tell us to be rejoicing in the gospel. Peter talks about you should rejoice about this. They were rejoicing with joy unspeakable and full of glory. So God gives the Holy Spirit and they are full of the Spirit of God and they rejoice with a joy inexpressible, unspeakable. You remember the fruit of the Spirit? This is worked in the Christian if he cooperates with the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love. What's the next one? Joy. Joy. Joy is the second fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's essential in the Christian. Paul says in Romans 14, the kingdom of God is not in eating and drinking, but righteousness and joy in the Holy Spirit. Notice he says it, joy, not holiness, not sanctification. You see, not righteous, and he means the righteous living, not just obedient, godly, righteous Christians. There's nothing worse than a person who says they're holy 
and godly and they're miserable. They're nothing. They're just absolutely, completely contradicting the Bible. Holiness, friends, is connected to happiness. The joy of the Lord, the fruit of the Spirit. It, you can't divorce it. There's no such thing. It's all idea of Christians being, you know, separate and holy and, and righteous and wanting to live for the Lord, but walking around like a wet weekend, miserable. It isn't true. It isn't biblical, is it? There's something wrong there. They can dis divorce holiness from joy. Friends, when you have real biblical Christian living, you have joy. And so it's a searching thing, isn't it? If I haven't got joy in my life, well, I need to examine myself. There is no joy for a sinner. How about that? None. None. If you live in sin, you're miserable. If you're a Christian and you live, and, you, and we all sin, don't we? But it, when we sin, what does it do? What's the proof that we're believers? It makes us miserable. That's why John says you cannot sin. You're miserable. And so you want to be joyful, well, well, walk in obedience. The devil doesn't tell you that, does he? He says, you sin, you can enjoy it for a second, for a moment, and then misery. Misery. It's the same outside for the unbeliever. It's the same for a believer. No, no, the, you, you don't listen to the lie. Think about the consequences. Say to yourself, it's a good way to discipline yourself. Do I want to be miserable? Do I really want this because it's going to make me miserable? I can say no to it because I can say, no, I'm going to walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh. I'm going to know something of the joy of the Lord. Oh, it's important. Listen to Paul. He says, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. How marvelous is that? Fill you. See, he's writing to believers. He's writing to people who are already, but he's talking about going on believing. That as you exercise your faith and as you even come to faith but practice that faith, it will fill you with all joy and peace. That's what the message of Christmas is, isn't it? And somebody prayed it this morning. The people outside have got to see the joy and the peace in us to be convinced of this Christianity and this Christmas message. In the United States of America, they have what's known as the Declaration of Independence. And in that, inalienable rights, there's a list of rights of, of men. One of them is this, the pursuit of happiness. Actually, Hollywood made a movie about it. It's a good movie if you've not seen it. The pursuit of happiness, based on that declaration of independence. Now, we have, the church has one called the Shorter Catechism. And do you remember that? The question one, what is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God. Ah, but to enjoy him, to enjoy him forever. So it's the same. You see, they're both focusing on joy and happiness. The pursuit of happiness. That's the, the, that's the, the, the correct way to understand this. So what have you got now? Man's chief end, pursuit of happiness, the, to glorify God and enjoy him. It's connected again, you see. Happiness connected to glorifying God. Now, some Christians have a trouble with this idea. I think some Christians are not sure that we should be happy, but they definitely are not sure about God being happy. I think they have a problem with that. Their idea of God is almost not scriptural. So God being happy, God being joyful. Listen, let me tell you with all my heart this morning, God is happy. I'll say it again, God is happy. That might be might be almost wrong to some of you. God is full of complete joy. Totally. Oh, the Bible tells us. If you're thinking that God doesn't do that, uh, on the Thanksgiving meal, I, 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 I spoke on worship and I said, God is rejoicing over us. He's singing over us and he wants us to sing with him and rejoice with him. It begins with God. God describes himself well it's described joy like this the joy of the lord can you see it the joy of the lord so when we look at joy we're talking about something that originates the source of it is god himself it's not some independent thing that's apart from god some blessing that god gives it's his very being it's the joy of the lord oh listen 
It doesn't originate with you. It doesn't originate with me. It originates with God. Now, what? that's what we want to get hold of this morning. If that's the case, then what is God's joy? What is his joy? Where does his joy, if it originates with him, what really causes it? And there is something that causes it. What gives him joy? There's many things the Bible says. No time to look into them. For example, God has, God has joy in himself, and he has joy over the, the Trinity. There is that perfection in the Godhead. God takes joy over his creation. Oh, there's no doubt about that from the Bible. But I suggest, according to Scripture, the thing that gives God the greatest joy is in the salvation of sinners. The great theologian Jonathan Edwards, he wrote about God's joy. And he wrote about God's glory. And he said that God's joy is connected to God's glory. It's just the same as our, we've said with us, and our happiness. But it's God's now. So God's joy is connected to God's glory. God rejoices, in other words, he said, when he is glorified. Can you follow him? Don't let me give you too much heavy theology. Let's keep it simple. Jonathan Edwards was a great theologian. But listen, God rejoices, he said. God rejoices when he is glorified. He finds infinite joy, he said, in his own glory and him, himself being glorified. So God's greatest, of course, God's joy is greatest. This is the logic of, of, of Jonathan Edwards. God's joy is greatest when his glory is greatest or when he is most glorified. The more he is glorified, the greater his joy if you follow him. So in conclusion, he argues like this, the work of redemption is the thing that brings God the greatest glory. Do you remember Jesus before he went to the cross? Father, the hour has come. This is it. Glorify your name. Glorify your son, the, the co-equal eternal son of God. Glorify me together with you in that prayer. Therefore, if you follow that, that redemption and salvation brings God the greatest glory, it obviously is the thing that brings him the greatest joy. Do you understand what Edwards is saying? And it's the Bible that's saying it. God's glory is connected to that wonderful joy that he has. His joy is a result of his glory, and God's greatest glory is seen in the salvation of sinners. And so it must bring him great joy. Now, I would go further with this, and I totally agree with Jonathan Edwards. He goes even further. He says, God's number one end, and we must get this, his number one end in salvation. This may offend some of you, but it is biblical, in my opinion. He's totally 100% right. God's number one end in salvation is his own happiness and joy. Do you get that? His number one purpose is his own happiness and joy. Does that offend you? Why is that the case? Because his number one purpose is his own glory and to be glorified. And it results in his joy. And so he's, he's got this purpose. His own joy is wrapped up in this. Now, do you realize what all this means? Well, let me put it like this. Let's bring it down to earth. We've had the theology lesson. Let's, let's think now. It's all here in this parable. This great truth is in this parable. The only real, true, lasting joy is found when you understand the parable of the prodigal son. I put it like that. If I fail to communicate this message in looking at it week after week, then we haven't got it. Once you understand this parable, once you enter into the meaning of this parable, we saw last time, for example, the elder brother, self-righteous, what happened with him? He doesn't see it, does he? He doesn't see it, and therefore he doesn't enter into it, and because he doesn't enter into it, he doesn't get it. He, he's saying it's wrong. His father's saying, no, it's right. He doesn't get it, so there's no joy. He doesn't enter into the joy. But all who do get it, all who do understand it, what the Bible says is this, they find joy. They find God's joy. They see the gospel. They understand the gospel. They see that this, the prodigal son is themselves, this terrible sinner that has sinned greatly against God, that isn't worthy to be called a Christian, to be called a child of God. I am not worthy. 
Oh, they see the terrible plight they were in. They were in the far country. They were dead. They were lost. They were, in a sense, in the mire of sin. They see their own sin. They see also, and it magnifies it, doesn't it, the great love that God has for them. And God's great plan to save them. They can say with Charles Wesley, amazing love. How can it be? That thou, my God, should die for me. Or another one, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene, and I wonder and I marvel how he could love me. A sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love to me. Let me ask you this morning, have you said that? Have you seen that? Have you repented of your sin? Have you returned to God through Jesus Christ? Have you believed upon the Savior? The more you see it, the more you grasp it, the more it will fill you with wonder and joy in believing. It will. You will enter into what the Bible calls the joy of the Lord. The joy that God has for your salvation and for the salvation of all sinners. And it's the key to the gospel, the key to Christianity. It really is the key, the golden key. It's knowing this joy. So many don't see it. So many don't enter into it, therefore. So many don't know anything about God's joy. They read this parable and it just goes straight over their head. They don't see it when he says, rejoice with me. I found that which was lost. Rejoice with me. I found that which was lost. It's a, he, he tells us there is joy in the presence of God and of the angels. There is joy in heaven over one sinner that repent. Look at verse 22. And the father said to the servant, bring out the best robe. I won't recap the message and put it on him. And a, and a ring upon his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it. Let's eat and be merry for this son was dead. This son, my son was dead and is alive again, was lost and is found. There's the ultimate cause repeated in our text. It's right. You see, it? it's right that we should be merry. We should make merry. We, re- we should rejoice and be glad because he was dead and now he's alive again. He was lost and now he's found. That's how it ends and that's how it begins and that's the message. God rejoicing over the repentance of every sinner that repents to truly returning to him. It causes God great joy. Heaven rejoices, he says. Angels rejoice and God himself rejoices and it's God's greatest joy found in the salvation of repentant sinners. Did you notice at the end of the first two parables, and it's focused really on this parable as well, that he uses the exact word, he says, over one sinner. Did you notice that? One sinner. There's no doctrine of revival here, is there? Oh, hundreds of sinners, marvellous, thousands of sinners, tens of thousands of sinners. No, just one. One is enough to cause God ecstatic, overwhelming joy over one sinner that repents. God is interested in individual souls of men. And it is God's joy, in his own joy, that he's talking about here. It's right, it's perfectly right that we rejoice and make merry and are glad. And I love the phrase where he says, rejoice with me, rejoice with me. The joy of the Lord, the joy that God has over over one sinner, over every sinner that repents. Literally, God rejoicing in himself over sinners that repent. Now, remember we saw with the elder brother, what did we see? Well, we saw that the father was pleading with him. He was literally begging him to come in. God pleading with men to repent. And I mentioned Ezekiel. The picture there is in Ezekiel. Why am I mentioning that now? Well, what did he say? I have no pleasure in the death of a sinner, in the death of the wicked. I have no pleasure. I don't get any pleasure out of that. I don't get any pleasure in people being lost. Gives God no pleasure to see sinners condemned and lost. 
He's moved with compassion. He's longing for them to return. We've seen that in this parable. He, he aches over them. He, he lets them go, but he loves them. And he longs for them to return. And he's weeping. And when they return, oh, the joy. Unspeakable. Inexpressible. He falls upon his neck and he says, Rejoice with me. This son was lost and was dead and now he's alive and he's found. Oh, it's marvelous. He has no pleasure in the death of a sinner, but he does have the opposite great pleasure in the salvation of a sinner. God's pleasure, God's delight, God's joy when that sinner repents and is saved. Nowhere is that truth more supremely illustrated in the life of our Lord himself. Not only his compassion, but in the very declarations about him in Scripture. You remember Hebrews 12, verse 2? He's described in Hebrews 1 as the express image of his person. The brightness of God's glory is God manifest in the flesh. But what does it say in 2? It says, look at Jesus, consider this, Jesus. He says, oh, for the joy. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame? And you've got to ask that question, what was the joy that was set before him? What was the thing that motivated him to go and suffer and die? What was that joy that brought him into this world? Remember, it was joy. The joy that brought him into this world. The, not just the love, the joy. The joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Listen, what is the joy set before him? I'll tell you what it is. It's sinners who were repented and in heaven who were saved. He saw them. He saw them believed. He saw them ransomed. He saw them restored. He saw them glorified. He saw it was the very motivation and the joy that he would have over all sinners repenting and saved and salvation completed. Redemption. It was, it was the number one purpose, his own purpose, his joy. Because he loves us. And the Bible says he loves us with an everlasting love. And his plan was to come and to save sinners. And that plan was motivated by his joy. Let me, let me give you a verse to show you. I'll give you two. John 15, first of all. It's page 571. John 15, verse 9. Our Lord unfolds the, the counsels of eternity in John 15, 16, 17. We get a kind of glimpse back to the fact that salvation didn't begin actually in Genesis 3, but it began before the world began. That in Jeremiah it's revealed, I loved you with an everlasting love. This joy has been there right from eternity. Listen to John 15 and verse 9. As the Father has loved me, I also have loved you, abide in my love. What is he just saying here? He's saying, I've loved you just the same as the Father loved me, and the Father has loved him eternally, everlastingly. I have loved you the same way. If you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Remember that word? It means watchful care and present possession. It means you hold on to the truth. Obedience is, is not even in question. You really wouldn't. It's inconceivable. You want to, you love and, and obey and long to, to be better Christians. You keep hold of it. You don't let go of it. You can't be obedient the same as Christ. His was perfect. Yours isn't perfect. But he says, as I obeyed. What he meant, the Greek word is, hold fast. If you hold fast to my word. Never let go of it. You're a believer. You're in my love. It's the reason why you do it. Because I've loved you. Listen. Oh, these things I've spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. How many times have I preached in this pulpit that God doesn't want us to be happy? You've heard it enough times from me. He does not want us to be happy. And I say it not to provoke you, it's biblical. There's not a verse in the Bible that ever tells us we're to have joy. It says joy unspeakable. That your joy would be what? Full. God doesn't want you to be ex happy, have some joy. He wants you to have fullness of joy. We're nowhere near the biblical standard. I say these things that you'd have joy. No, I say these things that your joy would be full. God's joy, the Greek there, is to be bursting over, literally, full, so it's uncontainable. 
That's what you need to pray for, because according to the Bible, God's people are to be full of joy. Rejoicing with, with God in this way. God doesn't have some joy, a part of joy, doesn't give us a portion. He says, I don't want you to be happy, I want you to be ecstatic. I don't want you to have joy, I want your joy to be full. Every verse in the Bible that says a Christian is to have joy, it's always a great amount of joy. It's always full. And listen to John 17 quickly. John 17 and verse 13. Listen to this. But now I come to you, he's praying the great high priestly prayer. These things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Isn't that a marvelous truth? Do you see what he's saying there? It's an incredible verse. We could just stop and not rush on and just meditate on that verse. Jesus wants us to have his joy. And his joy is full. Okay? And his joy was in us and in the gospel, in our salvation. And that he loved us in this way. If we are his joy. God delights in us. Do you know that? He delights over us. It's marvelous. Well, look at what he says here. It's staggering. It's, it's absolutely incredible, verse 13. Oh, listen, I, I speak in the world these things that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. And we already know what his joy is. So God wants you to get hold of the gospel so you appreciate the immensity, the breadth, the depth, the height, as Paul says in Ephesians, to know the love of God that passes understanding, that you might be filled with this love that you might have his joy fulfilled in you. That's what he wants. Oh, what a marvelous truth. We go to the end of the prayer, verse 20. I don't pray for these alone. Now we're praying for us, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, through the apostolic gospel, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me supernatural Christianity with God indwelling his people with power. And the glory which you've given me, I've given them that they may be one just as we are. Look at verse 24. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am. That they may behold my glory which you've given me for you loved me before the foundation of the world. I won't read any more. Can you see it? He wants sinners to be saved. His joy is tied up with their salvation. And his joy, he wants us to enjoy his joy and join with him, rejoice with him. And the great joy that's set before him is that day when we will be with him in glory. And his joy will be complete. You see what it says in Jude? We always end our Sundays like this now unto him who is able to keep us from falling. And present us faultless before the presence of his glory. With what? With exceeding joy. He's going to do it with great joy. Now that's the Lord's joy. His joy. Not my joy. His joy. He wants his joy fulfilled in me and you. He wants his joy to be in us. So when you look at the cross and when you look at the gospel... You only think of God's suffering for us, yes. The agony, oh, when you think of that, it's all, friends, it's awesome. The whole Godhead suffered. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, the Father's pain, the Father's agony. We'd sung it. He spared not his own son, says Romans 8, 32. We delivered him up. Or Paul in Galatians says, he loved me, thinking of Christ. He loved me, he gave himself for me. The majesty, the glory of the cross, of God's great plan to save a sinner like me and you. It's so amazing, it's so glorious that he perfectly, perfectly nails it on the head when he says, It is right. It's right that we should rejoice. It's right, says God, that we should make merry and be glad. It is in the end, as Jonathan Reds rightly said, it's the number one end of God's plan of salvation. That was the joy set before him, his joy, his own joy and happiness in the salvation of sinners. It's true. Let me tell you, it's true. God is rejoicing over every sinner that repents. It's all there in the parable. Go back and read it. And so we need to close this 
parable again with the question. We need to imply it. Let me ask you to search your own heart this morning for these answers to these questions. Is God rejoicing over you? Is God rejoicing over you? I tell you, if you repent of your sin and you trust Christ as your Savior, there is joy in heaven. But has he rejoiced over you? Is he rejoicing over you? Have you come? Have you repented? Have you turned? Have you found that happiness? God's desire is that you would not be outside any longer. You come in. That you'd not be far away. You come in. You come near. You come back to him. You return. Repentance, remember, means turning back to God and turning from sin. You need him. You need the Savior. He's got no pleasure over your death over your lostness right now and your eternal lostness God doesn't get any delight out of that but he does get pleasure when sinners repent and return I always believe this and you might think the most pessimistic thing to ever say on a Sunday morning but I believe that your life is utterly pointless if you live and die without Christ it's been a total waste of time I don't care if you're the richest person on earth. I don't care if you're the most successful person. I don't care what you do. If you don't find Christ as your Savior, it's all been a waste of time. But if you come and you repent and you find him, you'll find the greatest truth, the Bible says, is redemption, salvation, the thing that will bring heaven great joy. And I do believe the Lord is looking in your direction and looking in many people's direction at this time of the year, longing that they would come and return to him. And I do believe you've got to answer that question in your own heart. Is God rejoicing over you? But let me speak to you Christians. You're going to come to this table now. Let me put it like this. This text is for you. Are you rejoicing with God? Rejoice with me. It is right that we rejoice. It is necessary that we rejoice. Or do you need to pray with David? Restore unto me, Lord, the joy of thy salvation. The number one end of salvation is happiness and joy in God. It really is. Then if that is the case, then you and I should live for this gospel and live for this salvation of sinners. Because that is the chief end of man and that is the chief end of God. His glory and his happiness are linked to the gospel. Isn't that what the angels pronounced at his birth? Isn't that what they said? Let me remind you what they said. Oh, it's, it's, it's a tremendous truth. Now they were in the same country, shepherds, keeping their flocks. And behold, the angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were greatly afraid, and this is the message. And the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of what? Of great joy. Great joy, which will be for all people. Isn't that marvelous? For unto you, uh, sorry, for there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior. There's the great joy, who is Christ the Lord. Glory to God in the highest. Let's sing it this morning with joy in our hearts as we come to this table. Because as we end this parable, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. So this gospel brings God the greatest glory. It obviously brings him the most joy. May God get to our souls. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for your word this morning. We've looked at a lot of texts, Lord. We just pray now your blessing upon us. We ask, Lord, that you would be with us as we celebrate this glorious, glorious gospel around this table. For your name's sake, we ask it. Amen. We're going to sing Ark the Herald Angel.